My name is Luke Cooper. I'm currently the founding general partner of Latimer Ventures. Um, I started my career as an M&A attorney before starting my own company, which was acquired by Assurance. Um, we make uh, post-seed investments in black-led enterprise tech companies. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in and welcome to the VC Architects, the podcast where we share the real stories behind new VC fund managers and the blueprints used to make them successful. My name is Vlad Kazaku and I'll be your host today as we interview Luke Cooper, a Baltimore native who overcame poverty and built an incredible career as an M&A attorney turned tech entrepreneur with two successful exits before launching his own venture fund. This is an episode you cannot miss as we touch upon many of Luke's past stories that build the resilience required to succeed in the business world. For more information about starting and growing your venture fund, including show notes, highlight clips, and exclusive scenes, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the VC Architects, as well as on our website at thevcarchitects.com. This episode is brought to you by Flowly, the number one choice for deal screening and network management used by hundreds of investors from 50 plus different countries. Now, let's dive right in. Luke, such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much Thank for, you for taking the time to Exciting connect to with here. us today. I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation today, especially given your background. Let's zoom in a little bit on the very first entrepreneurial days, Caldwell Technology Solutions in 26, and then uh, prompt you to go back into Arena with Fixit in 2013. Curious to understand where this transition from lawyer to founder actually began and what prompted you to get yeah, back man, into it be Arena summed up a, very, few later, very a few years in, later. In three concise words, pain, profit, and purpose, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, as a, as a practicing lawyer, I mean, you're required to bill hours um, and you work on, on great, you know, transactions and opportunities that like, you know, yield knowledge, but you know, it's, you don't own anything. You don't, you don't really drive anything. Um, you're kind of like a traffic guard, which is fun too, in its own way. And I respect and admire great lawyers that are out there today that do that well for startups. But I knew it wasn't my ambition, my passion, or the thing that was going to bring me a lot of profit, right? And, you know, coming out of poverty, so that, so that pain is real, right? So that pain associated with being a lawyer is real. And so I, was, I, I always knew I was an entrepreneur. I wanted to move on from the practice of law at some point uh, to fulfill my, my longstanding, um, you know, desire to, to be an entrepreneur. And I was getting, like, tons of fax messages as an in-house counsel at State Farm on the fax machine about deals and transactions and opportunities. I mean, again, this is like 2005 timeframe. And so the, as, you know, faxes were very relevant back then uh, still. And I would get these faxes for deals and my boss would get pissed at me, you know, that I was, you know, sort of distracted. And I was always thinking about other you know ways to deploy my talent. And so that, that was a signal to me. You know, the fact that he was pissed at that told me that, I probably should do more of it, right? But maybe not here, right? And so um, I, I left and I was in search of a good opportunity and came across two friends, uh, the Caldwells, that were looking to build a great cybersecurity business. They knew a lot about the technology. They, you know, had excellent management skills. You know, they were just missing some critical components that I brought to the table. Um, I understood m and I knew our end goal was to sell the company and get to a, a strong exit. Um, you know, I understood culture building, um, you know, uh, creativity and how to sort of harness that in a constructive manner. And so, you know, I brought a lot of those things to the table that, you know, we put together as a team and really executed well over the course of four years and got to a strong exit, um, exiting the company to, to Khaki. And it was the first opportunity for my eyes to be open as to like the power of innovation, creativity and, and, and hard work. Um, you know, being applied to your own personal ambitions. So that was my first experience in how I transitioned from being a, a merger lawyer to being a merged uh, founder. A person who yeah. practices what at some point yeah. they were advising. This is not the traditional exit for the first time entrepreneur, being able to get to a successful exit in the first four years. So I'm curious to understand <laughs> how did you take that learning and move it back into the entrepreneurial arena in 2013 with the uh, fixed yeah, well, there, and uh, take that as well uh, to an exit and what you really question. did between um, the yeah, two. So, it's a, so uh, I, I didn't take it well, right? Like, I think you don't always, you, you learn well from mistakes, right? You learn a lot from, from errors and judgment or things that you, you know, could have done better. Right? And I think, I think the learning is more acute when it's those scenarios. But I think as humans, we're just innately 
wired to to just celebrate wins as opposed to like learn from them right and when we win we don't we don't do sort of the the deep technical analysis as to like what really drove those wins right and you i mean and you see this like in an engineering culture in engineering culture you do retros you know when you at the end of every week to talk about not just your failures but about your successes and like why it was a success and why that worked and that's what keeps an engineering team at the at a certain level of cadence and so I, i'm a big believer in agile methodology for that reason but I didn't really execute well on agile methodology as I was going through that first startup. I was just thinking that a lot of that was caused by my own effort, hard work, hustle, you know, some luck as well, and and a lot of intelligence, right? And so and so that that folly, that that hubris, oftentimes leads to other poor decision making, and you know, and so poor decision making sometimes doesn't reflect itself in like just making a bad decision. You got to get your timing wrong. And that's exactly what happened between, you know, my two successful outcomes. I bought a company out of bankruptcy that I thought I could turn around. It was a retail business, you know, and I, it was a brilliant deal. I'd sold off part of the manufacturing assets to finance the transaction. It was a big name legacy retail asset in the New England region and in, in the DC region. People like really knew those brands. And my goal was to sort of consolidate them over time. And, you know, I just got my timing wrong. And 2008, you know, 2009, you know, 2010, we were dealing with the fallout from the 2000, 2008 crisis. And I, I closed on that company in, in, in the middle of 2008, right? And so, and then the fall of 2008 happened. So I just got my timing wrong, you know, and I, I, and I didn't really have strong management skills. I had never run a company that had 400 employees, right? But those are, those are the realities that we step into situations with. And if we don't recognize our own sort of deficiencies in those moments, we don't put the right padding around us to, you know, to help us get through those scenarios. I bought into that company in 2008 and I was getting my MBA at the time. Um, and then, you know, put the company back into bankruptcy. And I think that's a skill too, like learning how to divest from something, both, you know, from a financial perspective and an emotional perspective. And it just made me stronger. It made me, it gave me more confidence. I talk about my in my experience, I write about them, you know, um, fervently. People know about my failures because I think it's important to, you know, not only expose to yourself why you failed, but to other people um, in a way that helps them navigate those things. But I think also it's important to take some time, right? So after the failure, you know, I took, you know, the better part of uh, 10 months just really figuring out what I was going to do. I stayed home with my son. Um, you know, I have a son and a daughter. Our son was, you know, three months old. And I stayed home with him. I taught 331 finance at you know, a local um, university as an adjunct and just to keep my finance skills sharp. And I just thought really deliberately about how I wanted to present my talent to the world. You know, what I wanted to do that would bring more profit, more passion, more purpose to my life. I just started to think about hard problems I'd seen. To be successful as an entrepreneur, I mean, you got to be really be focused on solving hard problems. And I thought very, very deliberately about you know, sort of problems I'd seen and one that I saw recurring, you know, sort of incessantly was the poor customer service experience that you got when you dealt with insurance companies. And I was part of that infrastructure as an M&A attorney and also in-house counsel. I'd seen it firsthand. You know, we would get these faxes of cases and claims and other things from clients and it was a slow process and they never got their money back in time. They never got their, you know, their cars or things, their possessions back. There was not efficient communication. There was never any sort of data aggregate that like a repository that told me as the in-house counsel, told claims, told the insurance company, the third party administrator and the customer where we could see all of that data in one place. Like all of those things were kind of missing from the experience. And so as I start to, talk, to think very deliberately about that, I, you know, I began to think about what kind of solution could occupy that space. And it took us about a year and a half to, to really land on the right solution. But by 2014, I'd gone through Techstars and really been challenged on the model in ways that made me think about, you know, the right entry point, the right solution, web-based, web app, mobile app. I mean, there's a lot of decisions. And ultimately, we built a web mobile a API that could connect all your data to what was happening to your $18 billion of mobile devices, which, you know, kind of is what's spent annually on, on this category. Um, and, and we later learned there was all like manual processes that were governing it. We also learned that 
50,000 daily genius bar requests where someone would say, I have a problem, you know, and a, and a large plurality there were coming from, of those were coming from, you know, the corporates that didn't have the infrastructure to solve their own problems. And so my team and I, we, we quickly deduced that if we built a product that could accommodate the corporates in a way that gave them a, a, a one pane of glass, so to speak, of all their information and also solve the problem for them by connecting them with, you know, real time availability of technicians that were out there in the field that could solve problems. We could build that into a big company. Right? I knew it. I knew that we could, and we struggled, right? We struggled, you know, we raised six and a half million dollars for the company. I grew it 300% year over year acquiring, you know, half of the fortune 500, but we were still running out of by 2019. And I knew I had to get to an outcome. We had been developing relationships along the way with strategics. And, you know, one of the strategies that we built a great relationship with led to a great conversation in Las Vegas that ultimately led to the acquisition of the company six months later. And the company went on to go do more than half a billion dollars for the acquirer. And now I'm an investor. And as I look back at that time, you know, it took a year between the time that I was an investor and, and um, became an investor and the time that I, I exited my last company, and I was just investing in other companies. And investing really with the idea that, you know, hey, are, are there other people that are like me that, you know, have great companies, you know, they just need a little bit of support, both financially and otherwise that could, you know, lead them to a better outcome than the one I got capturing more of the value that they're creating for the acquirer. And so that's what I'm doing now. I'm taking advantage of the mispricing that I see happening to these, you know, incredibly gifted potential black unicorns that are overperforming, they're undervalued, and I have unique access to them. And b before we dive into Latimer Ventures and your work as an investor, I'm curious to spend just a little bit of time on the fundraising journey of Fixed, because before backing founders, you were a backed founder. So what was some of the learnings that you carried over from that fundraising journey into now your journey as an investor and helping other founders and building a little bit more empathy? Maybe yeah, for the I think I, of the I've fundraising process um, for the fundraising process, but there's a there's a difference between empathy and compassion, right? Empathy is like you know, hey, I feel bad that you're in that situation. When I was starting Fix, for example, you know, during the very muddy part, I had a daughter going to stage four cancer, right? Our she, our four year old went into stage four cancer. A lot of people empathize with us, right? And like and empathy, you know, in the case of cancer, for example, is hey, I feel sorry that you have cancer. That's awful. Like we feel awful. That's t I, we feel bad, and you just kind of stay kind of stuck in that you know sort of exchange, right? But nothing actually gets accomplished, you know. And I, so I think you, as a founder, you, you and as a as a person supporting founders, as an investor, you need empathy for sure, right? But you also need compassion, and compassion is really, hey, I feel sorry that this has happened, but you know, how do we how do I help you navigate? You know, as and sometimes navigation is just like, all, all right. Today, we're going to, you had a tragic event happen. Today, all we're going to work on is just getting out of bed. That's it. We're just going to work on getting out of bed. That's compassion, right? So I try to exercise compassion as much as possible. And I have deep compassion and, and, um, and empathy for, for founders who raise money because I'm going through that experience myself as a, as a, as a venture manager. And, you know, and the, and the challenges are the same, right? It's, it's tell me how you're different, you know, but don't be too different or tell me, you know, how you're going to make money. Who's going to buy this at the end of this? How do, what's your exit plan? You know, what's your portfolio construction look like? How many companies of a certain variety are you going to invest in? It's, it's very similar to the founder experiences, but I think a lot of VCs don't come from a founder experience and they sort of warp how, you know, VCs and VC funds get formed and therefore get filtered through the market. Right. And so I think that's not the best model, right? I think you should be taking advantage of all the, strong attributes that you develop as a founder and applying them to other things where they where they're applicable. And I think there's a ton of things that are applicable as a founder to the fundraising journey that I'm on as a as a venture manager and I just try to, you know, be thoughtful about, you know, which tools to take out of the tool belt, you know, at the right time, you know, to accomplish the mission. And you know, so I don't divorce myself of the things that I learned as a founder through this journey. I just selectively use the pieces that apply when they apply and, and modified accordingly based on the feedback that I get from a wealth of advisors 
Absolutely. There's like a wealth of experiences that build towards the ability to both be a great investment manager, but also a great supporter for founders who are now leaning on to your experiences and your background into helping growing their companies. And I think it's a very unique angle when a founder with the level of experience that you do comes into the venture That's ecosystem right. because they just have a very different perspective That's on right. how things are run and should be run. So I'm curious to understand the decision to become an investor. I don't think we touched upon that yet. The moment when Luke said, hey, I think this is now the time for me to start deploying capital and supporting others yeah. rather than yeah, no, building it, it, it comes down to myself. what I talked about in the beginning, right? Like, you know, pain, profit, purpose, right? And, you know, the, the pain of like the practice of law, like, oh, I don't want to do that. Got me out of it, right? The profit motivation from being, you know, growing up in abject poverty with a father in prison, um, you know, has me fully focused on wealth creation for myself and the communities that are affected by historical disenfranchisement from all of these resources, right? And we all know the numbers, right? Less than 2% of venture goes to, you know, to black founders, you know, less than 0.4% goes to black fund managers, right? And so like the, the issue just elevates as you, and becomes more severe as you pan out from sort of, sort of the founder perspective. Um, and so, yeah, so like, and then, and then purpose, right? I, I do things with deep intentionality, you know, hopefully always the right intentions. I think that's important as well. But, you know, that purpose really locks me into the largest opportunity set that, you know, can be created to fulfill my purpose. And so if my purpose is to create wealth for myself and my community, I could start another company. Yeah, I could have certainly done that after my last exit. Um, and that was a, that certainly was a, a thought, right? Could I do that? You know, there was a lot of thoughts, a lot of different things I wanted to do. Um, but when I thought, you know, very deeply about like I wanted to affect the world, well, I want to affect a lot of people. And and to do that, you know, I thought the best way I, you know, I could do that and do it most efficiently was to deploy capital to them, give them my playbooks, give them my words of inspiration, you know, have those people hear the timber in my voices and my voice that, you know, could lead to the inspiration, you know, opportunity that they needed to create for themselves to, to not only create you know, the value that their, you know, solutions are doing out in the world, creating out in the world, but also capture. And so I could have built another company and hired a hundred employees and 50 of them would be black. And, you know, maybe they exit for millions of dollars and make money. That's, that's impact for sure. But if I could do that for 20 companies and each of those companies has a hundred employees, you know, 50 of whom are black, you know, that's a thousand. All right. And so it's just, a, you know, it's just magnifying the results of what I want to see in the world that's already good. It feels like choosing the path with the best leverage to fulfill that greater purpose. And let's explore for a second your thesis at Latimer Ventures, mm -hmm. because it is very much purpose-driven, supporting Black and Hispanic founders at the earlier stages. For the people who are not yet very familiar with your work at Latimer, what is briefly your work? And how do you best support um, those founders? Yeah, so my work is really to identify the most talented, promising black-led enterprise tech companies that are in the U.S. today. Like that's 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 the, the overwhelming majority of my job: sourcing, identification of great um, tech entrepreneurs, investing in them is the second leg of that. Once we get through sort of criteria that they meet and that the company meets for the standards that I set for myself and the standards that my LP set for me. And once I've identified that, you know, we've had, you know, uh, all the warm and fuzzy good feelings about, you know, making an investment, we make an investment, you know, we're fully committed. And that commitment doesn't stop with just a check. That's, that commitment extends to, you know, advice, feedback, playbooks, everything from sales playbooks that help them drive customer acquisition you know, repeatability in their sales model, you know, persona development so that they can target the right customers at the right time to M&A playbooks that help them understand, you know, what the value of the company is that they're building and how do they, you know, accrete that value, you know, to the acquiring companies, to the market in some way through an IPO, you know, what an IPO journey looks like, right? All those things are things that, you know, we sort of help them think about um, as they're navigating, you know, their way to, to a win. Um, and then, you know, give them some things to think about post, you know, post investment, right? We eventually are going to sell the company or exit. What do you do then? Like, then, like, what are the kinds of opportunities that are going to come to you 
that you should be thinking about, et cetera. And so when I think about Latimer Ventures, you know, Latimer Ventures is just like one piece of the continuum of resources and enablements that I want to provide to founders over time. You know, it extends out to Latimer Advisory, and the M&A components to help them think about M&A. You know, and then the future will have Latimer, you know, consulting, maybe that, that helps them with their careers as they think about the next, you know, sort of board seats and, you know, book deals and other things that are going to come to them as a result of the incredible stories that these folks have, the journey that they've gone through to get to those, um, to those outcomes um, and the communities they come from and how they can so deeply impact them with, um, you know, news of what they've done. And it's a very convincing narrative, right? With a lot of different synergies between some of those entities. But there was one point when an external party, the very first LP said, you know what, Luke, this makes a lot of sense to me as well. Here's some money to make this a reality. Can we peel back the curtain a little bit behind oh, yeah. that very first interaction, the very first yes, who solidified the, the fact that this is happening? Latimer Ventures is yeah, not it just was really a plan a group, anymore, right? it's an actual um, fund. So it wasn't, I wouldn't say it's one individual. There's certainly some individuals that are um, more prominent than others. Um, you know, Dan Rizzo comes to mind. He was he just, you know, was a believer right at the beginning, but he didn't commit right away. It was it was a group of us that sat down and I and I shared my ideas and I and I, I encourage founders to do this too. Share your ideas as fucking raw as you can make them. Right? The more raw you share your idea, the more real it is, the closer it is to the vision and the reality that you want to see in the world. Um, and that's what investors you know, will understand um, the best and they'll be able to give you feedback on that, right? Because um, where you start is never where you, you know, um, finish always. It's always, you know, sort of a journey. And so I started with this idea that I could raise a very large fund that could do not only direct investment into diverse founders, but also um, indirect investment through fund of funds activity, right? And I got great feedback, right? And and the feedback was really like, hey, you know, doing it was feedback I tell founders all the time, right? Doing one thing is hard, right? Doing two things in a startup is not necessarily you know twice as hard. It's exponential, right? And so in thinking about that, you know, I sort of stepped back from the idea of doing an indirect fund, you know, alongside of our direct vehicle. And then you know the investors in the room gave me tons of feedback on that. And they all committed in that room. I mean, there's no better feeling than to have a meeting like that and have all your investors in one room and they're, they're talking about your dreams, your visions, or embarking on the journey. There's no better feeling than walking through all of those things and then getting to a place where investors say, wow, that's amazing. There was also pruning feedback that helped me evolve the idea into, into what we have, more of what we have today, uh, which is a better starting place than where I, you know, I think where I initially started. But those investors were in, incredibly invaluable, right? So, like, you know, for me, it wasn't really one investor at one moment. It was a series of investors, you know, some collectively in that one moment. And then over time, here and there, there have been like one off conversations that have led to, you know, big checks from investors like Doug Song. You know, he built Duo Security. I, mean, I have just deep admiration for him and his team and what they were able to accomplish over the course of 10 years. Um, and he sold it to my, to, to Cisco for over, you know, two and a half billion dollars. I mean, it's an incredible accomplishment as a founder, particularly a diverse founder from Baltimore, right? And so to have someone like that believe in you, that understands the model of connecting corporate capital, corporate, you know, ventures and corporate development teams, the M&A components that drive them with the startups that, you know, need that optionality, have great products, but oftentimes can't, can't find these corporates. Um, there's no big, bigger happiness than, you know, seeing someone like him come on board and like, and be a big supporter of what we're doing. I can only really imagine how powerful it feels to have some of those other successful individuals see and validate the, the long-term vision of you and, and what you're building at Latimer. So I would love to also take the other side of the coin, because I think this is a topic that a lot of people don't discuss. And you mentioned earlier of sharing also what didn't go well. What is one of the reasons people said no? Where did you face rejection from the LP saying, you know, this doesn't really fit my criteria? Was it more related to the LP's thesis and not finding necessary allocation for this particular strategy? Was it not believing that this is an opportunity worth pursuing? Where did you see well, the most pushback? Record, right, like you, Luke, you're, a, you're a twice exited tech entrepreneur. 
you know, marginal success, right? In my opinion, right? Like when you, what we don't do in this society is we, we don't always acknowledge, you know, the journey that people have taken to get to the places that they are. Right. And so like, you know, if you get to a $10 million exit, $20 million exit, $30 million exit, and you're from abject poverty and you grew up in Pequanix projects, like I did, that's, that, that is, that's incredible. That's unbelievable. Right. It's unbelievable. But in the world of tech, you know, a $30 million acquisition is like, you know, kind of like a Tuesday, right? Like no one's, pay, no one's paying attention to that. And, and what I'm, what I'm saying is that like, yeah, we don't, we don't want to just keep doing $30 million acquisitions, but you know, for somebody who has the capacity to overcome those kinds of things, to get to that, you know, that scale of an exit multiple times, um, they have capacity to do a lot more, a lot more and a lot bigger. They're just missing something. They might be missing, you know, the skill experience. Um, networks that drive, you know, the connectivity they need to these capital markets. They might be missing, you know, the capital, right, um, to to actually drive toward those goals. Right? And and so, you know, it, you know, I I took it personal, right, when when I would get that pushback that like, oh, your track record, you know, doesn't really, you know, sort of justify, you know, such a large allocation, you know, because you know you haven't been an investor, you've been mostly a founder. Um, and so that was the, that's an emotional response, right? And I think that's natural for us as, you know, founders, you know, who are entering the world as VC, like you, you bring all the emotional baggage with you that makes you a great founder too, right? along with the founder, all those things that, you know, make you su successful and succeed as a founder, right? You need passion and passionate delivery of your ideas, all those things. Um, but you need a little bit of something different as a VC also, right? Like portfolio construction, you know, compliance with internal processes is important. Like you, you can't overlook those things, right? Because they dictate the measure of, of information and the returns that you're driving back to found back to the um, to limited partners. And those limited partners are, you know, um, responsible for incredible amounts of money, right? And so when I so when I see that incredible linkage, I understand that, you know, it's a, it's a fair comment, you know, to say that, Hey, you know, we, we are not fully confident in your, in your track record just yet. And so I think it's a combination of like demonstration of my angel track record that stands in the place of like a, you know, sort of professional venture investing track record, you know, yielding seven and a half X over the course of two years for my investments and my own venture, you know, angel portfolio. And then also a mix of demonstrating to my LPs that, you know, I, I could bring on the right team, right? That I'm not only a one man show, that I could bring on the right team that could help with, you know, some of the, you know, more traditional things that they expect to see in a conventional, um, you know, conventionally formed, um, you know, venture capital firm. And so I brought, recruited, you know, three or four people and ultimately went with, you know, the, the person that I thought was the best. Um, and she's just been so additive in so many ways, but she has a more traditional background. So yeah, so I the, push, the biggest pushback was track record, and you know, and 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 again, as a as a you know new manager, as a new founder, like it's important to just like just hear the feedback, right? <laughs> just hear it. Like a lot of times we I don't we say yes, we we actually you know tell the person that we hear it, but we, we go off on an emotional sort of rant that this isn't right and this is wrong. Like just hear it, just hear the feedback. And, and take the pieces of it that, you know, make you better and also, you know, bring you closer to the fundraising goals that you have without, you know, sort of compromising your values. And it's an interesting storyline that we've heard before around the emotional impact that fundraising has on founders as well as investors, right? And, and being having the thick skin to handle that rejection and knowing that not everybody is going to see the world the way you see the world. And it's even more pronounced in previously less funded populations where, you know, their viewpoint is even more different than the status quo that the industry has been perpetuated over the past years. Before we jump on the rapid fire part of the episode, I'm curious to understand your process around delimiting between feedback that's worth listening to and feedback that is not worth listening to and handling the emotional response around navigating yeah, those I think, more I difficult think, situations. You know, everybody should have a set of core values, right? Like, you know, I think COVID was a great time for us to sit back and say, you know, hey, you know, things are slower right now, 
this is a great time to revisit what I stand for. I mean, you'd be alarmed how many people I, I ask that question to, like, what do you stand for? They don't really have an answer <laughs> at all, right? And so, but when I, when I think about that, that question, right, to me, you know, it reflects a set of values that, you know, sum up how I think about myself, the world, and my interaction with it, right? And when I think about those things, I, you know, the, the, some of the core values that I think about that are important to me as an individual, you know, are hard work, patience, you know, sacrifice, self-confidence, um, right intentions, um, you know, some of those things. And, and, um, and so, so when you're, when you're interacting now with the world, with that perspective and you come across, a, you know, um, a mentor or, you know, someone who's, who's giving you feedback that, um, you know, is not coming from a place that is consistent with those values. That's a signal. That's a signal that that advice might be tainted in some way. Right. And so I think it, I think it, you know, it, it's important to recognize that as founders and not like, not, not, um, you know, not ignore, um, you know, sort of the, the, you know, the reality of what you're seeing. Right. Cause oftentimes as founder, we just, we second guess ourselves often. Right. We, and, and we're in such desperate, you know, sort of needs and um, circumstances that we will typically listen to folks that we shouldn't listen to because like they got money and we don't, you know what I mean? Um, and I think early on in my career, I probably, you know, would, would, you know, adjust accordingly with, you know, the ebbs and flows of, you know, different investors and what they thought, you know, right. And, and I think over time I, I didn't do that. And it led to me really redefining my values, standing up for myself in a way that, you know, not only my, my kids would be proud and my community would be proud, but my ancestors would be proud as well. And so I, so I think that's first, just recognizing it and not, and knowing that it's like, not, not you, right? It's just, it's, it's them. It's not there. It's not your problem, you know, necessarily it's there, isn't it? And then once you recognize that, I think that, that unlocks you from the emotional trauma and the emotional response of it. So first thing is like, just having the, the, the courage to accept what you're seeing and know that it's out of place with your values. And then secondly, I think is having the courage to to speak up for yourself right in a way that that doesn't necessarily come from an emotional response kind of place right for me i, I i've had moments like that where i you know getting feedback that i didn't think was you know adequate or sufficient or relevant or un i just felt like it was coming from a place of maybe that person's own ego right uh, or those kinds of things and i, I was okay like you know, basically, you know, saying those things. As a founder, you've got to have a diplomatic, diplomatic tongue, right? Like you, 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 things, a thing might be true that you need to say to your, your team, but like how you say that will dictate like the culture that you're trying to set for the, the company. And so just because a thing is true, doesn't mean that a true and also difficult to say, doesn't mean that a, you don't say it or B, you, you don't say it with tact. And I think that's important for founders to sort of um, embrace. And I, and so I've, I've been in conversations where I've had those, you know, discussions with investors and at the end of it said, Hey, you know, I, I, I really you know, enjoy, you know, the, having this conversation with you, you know, um, you know, in fact, during my series A, we were raising and we got a, a quarter of a million dollar commitment from a very well-known firm in Manhattan. You know, I spent very, basically that last half of the afternoon with him, hustled to get there. He was late to the meeting, you know, kind of casual throughout the meeting, flippant, said a bunch of crazy things about Baltimore and the people that live there. And I, I felt some type of way about that, right? And I, I had a quarter of a million dollar commitment. I had, at that point, I had like maybe 300,000 of the whole two and a half million dollar round raised and, or 3.5 million, 3 million dollar round raised. And so I needed that money. Desperately, I needed that money. Um, but on the train ride home, I, I you know, pull out my laptop. You know, I, and I wrote him an email, you know, that I still have to this day. And I said, you know, listen, I, I, I really, you know, enjoyed meeting with you. I thought, you know, some of your feedback was really, you know, spot on and helpful. I thought some of it, you know, was, was, you know, outside of what I believe in terms of my own cultural values. And so, you know, I don't know that we're a, a great fit and I just, I, I'm okay with that, you know, and I, I wish you well, and I'll, I'm happy to keep you updated on our progress, but I, I don't think we're a great fit. And he said, okay, no problem. And that was it. And like, again, like, I think we all, we all overestimate people's response to us when we, when we're really raw and honest in that way. But oftentimes it's just like, 
It's just like a Tuesday for them. I think that's a great answer. And it touches upon so many different things from the self-awareness of understanding what your core values are to the courage to take in those core values at heart and the awareness of other people's similar vibration <laughs> to those to some extent, right? And understanding who really is seeing the world through the same lens that you are uh, and being okay that's not right. to partner with the ones right. that don't. That's exactly right. I think it's a great point to turn to the very last part of the interview. Three quick questions with three quick answers to let the people know more about Luke Cooper and the person behind Latimer Ventures. And the question we like to start with is one thing that most people don't know about that I'm Luke a vegan, that they should know. And I've been a vegan you. for a very long time. When I was starting out my last company, Olivia, our daughter, I'm sick. I, I was always like, you know, health conscious, vegetarian, mostly throughout most of my life uh, from college. But, you know, I think, you know, lack of knowledge about you know, how food really affects us probably kept me eating things I shouldn't eat. And I'm, you know, grateful for the experience I went through, you know, with Olivia because it exposed my, my thinking and my, you know, my mindset to, you know, other, you know, ways to sort of achieve, you know, optimal health. And, um, you know, I, I began to like really look into that and, you know, became a vegan and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very much still a vegan. I mean, such a powerful reflection to see that through a, through a positive and life-changing light. Second question is one person you consistently looked up to throughout your career that was to some kind yeah, mentor there, there or are, guiding light to you. Yeah, there were a number of, of, of people um, that I looked up to over the course of my career. I think early on, you know, folks like Miss Matthews, uh, who was my, you know, prep school teacher, um, English teacher who made sure every single day, you know, even though my collars were dirty because I lived in the project and I came to this prestigious prep school every day, um, you know, and I, I couldn't afford lunch. Right. And she and she made sure that I could afford lunch every day, make sure I had, you know, a little bit of cash so I wasn't, you know, walking around the lunchroom begging. Um, and so I looked up to her. We, we had a great relationship up until she died um, about two years ago. And, um, you know, she's someone that, you know, I got, you know, um, a lot of, you know, my sense of uh, devotion to my, my values and what I believe and to a set of values that, you know, um, you, you embrace and hold on to fervently, um, you know, even in the face of, you know, racism, you know, um, <laughs> or opportunity, right? I think people sometimes shift when there's an opportunity to, to be successful, you know, they'll, uh, you know, accommodate, you know, that person and those, uh, those systems in a way that, you know, don't reflect their values. And she's someone that's like really helped me, you know, sort of think through that, you know, so she's somebody has been a great mentor for a very long time. You know, folks like Jim Cash, you know, board chair of Walmart, um, who is, you know, integrated the basketball teams in the sixties. He was, you know, on the first, you know, all black basketball team that started, you know, starting five at like Kansas state or some school like that. Um, and, uh, you know, Harvard Emeritus, you know, professor, you know, their buildings erected to him on Harvard's campus and, um, and just a brilliant man. Uh, and, it, and he goes about his work in a way that is inclusive, right? Cause I, and I, I believe that I believe that we're all responsible for this work of elevating, you know, the voices that have been less heard in our society, um, and breaking down systems that have, you know, um, historically held people back from, you know, fully participating in the American dream. Um, and he does that in a way that, 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 you know, gets everybody working together. And so I, you know, he's somebody that I deeply admire as well. He's been a great mentor for me, you know, um, over time. I mean, I can, I can reel off a bunch of other mentors and folks that I draw inspiration from, you know, some, some are not with us anymore. Very inspiring answer. And I'm really curious to hear your answer to the last question, a longstanding transition at our company, which is ending the conversation with a point of gratitude. So really quick and only one person that is allowed as an answer yeah. someone that you wish to say thank you or provide some gratitude to looking back at your work yeah I, either I, investing I would say thank you to my family I, I thank you to my my um you know to to uh, my my kids you know they haven't they've watched me through this entire journey you know they've they've been on phone calls i remember you know as i was <laughs> um exiting the last company you know we you know one of my employees you know did some some crazy stuff like really really crazy stuff that you know really necessitated you know a termination and my kids had to sit through that you know because the only way i could do it was on a phone call zoom 
you know, at a time when we were trying to do, you know, sort of a family activity and they had already, you know, been deferred, you know, for like a whole week on this activity and I was not going to do that again. And so they sat through that and I thought it was good learning for them, but also, you know, the, the, the uneasiness with that kind of, you know, action that you've got to take as a CEO, right, um, is not just felt by you. It's felt by the people around you as well. And, you know, I'm sure my kids felt that. So, like, they, they've got it. They had to endure some of the, you know, uneasiness I felt, you know, through, you know, my journey as a founder. So I'm so thankful for them and their mom, you know, for just being an incredible mom, incredible wife. Um, ally, supporter, you know, of all of my ambitions um, and someone who's just like really, you know, sort of made sure that the pieces were picked up um, when, you know, uh, you know I, I couldn't be there to pick them up. And so I'm, I'm very incredibly grateful and thankful for those people. Fantastic. Look, my gratitude goes to you for such an honest, transparent and really engaging conversation that I'm certain listeners will take note of and learn a lot from. It's been very inspiring to hear more about your story and your background. And I'm excited about having you back on the podcast at Latimer Ventures Fund 2 and discussing your continued success as you're continuing to back unbelievable founders from previously unfunded backgrounds in a city that before you may not have been on the venture map as broadly as it is right now. And excited to uh, see Thank your you, Vlad. Excited to be here. Thank, Thank you. you so much. What a great conversation. If you enjoyed it, make sure to like and subscribe to our podcast and be on the lookout for a new episode in two weeks featuring another amazing fund manager and their story. This podcast was made possible by Flowly. If you're a fund manager, angel investor, family office, or syndicate lead who receives a lot of deals or simply wants help sorting through the noise, create a free account today on Flowly at flowly.com. That's F-L-O-W-L-I-E dot com. And get access to an AI-assisted deal screening engine and network manager that will dramatically improve how you work. Are you ready to take your investing journey to the next level and join hundreds of investors across the globe who use the platform every single day? Find the discount code in the show notes and sign up today. That's it for today's episode. See you next time.